When you unseal a deck of cards for the first time, you might throw two cards out, the Jokers. Even if you do keep them around, they're not going to be seen in most games. Instead, they collect dust in the corner of your desk drawer. But every so often, you could play a game with special rules. Jokers are wild. And here, in only the most niche situations, the card you never see shimmers, transmutates. Its potential is its power. There's another card, another Joker, in a different game you might be familiar with if you play Smash Ultimate, The Fool. In Tarot, The Fool represents possibility, unformed clay on the start of its journey, waiting to be given a shape. We all dabble with secondaries. Most of them are bad. If we break them out in bracket, we laugh it off and pretend the loss doesn't count because we're just messing around. But not everyone is like that. Sure, top players have secondaries, but do any of them truly transform on a regular basis? Smash is ruled by royalty, each specific in their powers. But there's one player who we don't see that often, and when we do, it's anyone's guess what shape he's gonna take. A few months ago, Zachary showed up at Kagari B5 playing a new character. Sora. He'd literally been released less than two weeks prior. Zachary won the whole damn tournament over Shutone, Kome, and 509 other competitors. This may seem like anomaly, but for Zachary, anomaly is routine. His victory with Sora marks his seventh major victory with a different character. For the sake of the data at hand, we're calling any S slash A tier tournament a major, and no one, well, almost no one, plays as many characters at the level of Zachary on their way to a tournament victory. Once the definitive wolf, now Zachary walks into every new event as a roulette wheel wrapped in Enigma. But when Zachary shows up with a new character, it's for good reason. Zachary's been talking a big game for months about Sheik's potential. So what does he do? He shows up to Kagari B6 and breaks out the Sheik en route to another major victory. Japan is known for character specialists like Shutone and T like the drink and T like the letter, but Zachary has cemented himself as an outlier. With an 89 character roster, Ultimate's no stranger to counterpicks. But what we want to propose is that Zachary doesn't just counterpick. He integrates new characters so holistically that it makes him one of the most uniquely formidable players to ever grace competitive Smash. But he didn't start that way. Zachary has established himself as one of Smash's greatest phenoms, but not by pigeonholing himself. Instead, he is endlessly adaptable, constantly mutating. Smash Ultimate's wild card. With the win at Kagari B6, Zachary can now claim to have used eight different characters in his runs to major wins. Those are Wolf, Joker, Rob, Mr. Game & Watch, Sora, Sheik, Mario, and Ike. That ties him for the most in Ultimate's two plus year history. Zachary has officially played more characters on his way to a first place finish than most players have won a set with during tournament, period. The name joining him shouldn't be too shocking, as he's only been the game's best player over that history, MKLeo. Tweak, at 7, is the only other player to win a major with more than three different characters. These three seem to confirm what many have said since Smash Ultimate's release. This is a counterpicker's game. With such an overwhelmingly huge roster, it can be easier to simply learn a new top tier than to learn a bunch of obscure and awkward matchups with the main. But is this held true across top-level play? Let's see just how big of standouts these three actually are. This is a graph of Mars's character usage by month. Mars is one of the many players tied with two characters used during his major wins. His main, Zero Suit Samus, and his Captain Falcon, which he used as part of his win at Mexican Major Smash Factor 8. This is what a solo main with an occasional crisis of confidence looks like. He uses Zero Suit Samus 86% of the time on our database, with none of his secondaries topping 5% usage. Now this is what a full-on solo main looks like. That's Meister, who used Mr. Game & Watch in 99.01 of his matches in our database. The Pichu came out against MKLeo at Frostbite 2020, as well as in Grand Finals of a Mexican tournament in March 2019. Other than that, he games. And you watch. Let's find somebody more interesting. Here's a player known for multi-maining. Proto Banum has been a Lucina player since day one, but has played around with both an Inkling and a Min Min secondary, leaving the Lucina at only 58% usage in our database. You can see the clear shift here. The Inkling got occasional usage for Proto in 2019, but after Min Min's release, the Squids and our kids were nowhere to be found. There were some rumors of a Steve in Proto's pocket before Summit, but it has yet to make itself seen. Now let's get to the heavy hitters. Here's MKLeo. 
Ultimate's number one player has spent the game's lifespan bouncing back and forth between characters, and, well, winning with most of the ones he touches. His Joker falls just under 50% usage rate at 47%, with Byleth at 20%, and his first main, Ike, 10%, as the only others to cross double digits. But a look at his month-by-month -month shows clear phases. First Ike, then brief flirtations with Lucina and Wolf, followed by the clear shift to Joker, and then the clear post-lockdown shift to Byleth. Now here's Tweak. Very colorful. Where Leo doesn't have a single character with a usage rate over one half, Tweak puts him to shame, not having a single character with a usage rate over one third. Diddy at 30% and Wario at 27% both break the quarter mark, with Pokemon Trainer at 20% as the only remaining character in double digits, and the Wolf 9% coming just decimal points shy. Again, we see fairly clear phases. After dabbling with Krom in the game's first month, Tweak landed primarily on Wario, used Pokemon Trainer for much of PGRU Season 2, and then switched to Diddy over Lockdown. And finally, our protagonist. Here's Zachary, becoming a completely new player on seemingly a month-to-month -month basis. Through multiple decades and titles, this was rarely the path to success in competitive Smash. But who better to blaze this new path than Ultimate's wildcard? When Zachary first arrived in the United States for Ultimate's first international major, Genesis 6, we knew he was going to be great. Other than the single elimination Umabara SP, a severely rushed tournament due to time constraints and a surprisingly high entrant count, Zachary had won every single event he entered in Japan in Ultimate's first month. So we knew he was going to be pretty good. But that was about it. How would he handle traveling, the more aggressive American meta, the crowds, the grind of a multi-day tournament, or even smaller things like his playstyle? What made him so good that he was able to take out the likes of Abadango, Hikaru, and Ken, Japanese players that had put together dominant performances at American events throughout Smash 4's lifespan with such seeming ease? And could he keep doing it on the biggest stage yet? The answer to that last question would be a resounding yes, but more fascinating was how he was doing it. Specifically, by just standing there. He's just standing there. Menacingly! Zachary is an intensely quick learner. By the time Genesis 6 rolled around, very few of Ultimate's pros, which is to say Smash 4's pros, had figured out what Zachary had realized in the span of just a month. This was not a game like Smash 4 where your shield could keep your dash safe. Every movement was a commitment, and Zachary played it in a way very few others did, reacting to animations with dash attacks and aerials to stuff out any option the opponents picked. No set from Zachary's G6 run proved his ability to download like his winner's top 8 qualifier against Light. Smash's patron saint of aggression, Light was looking poised to usher in a new golden age of rushdown behind the strength of his fox. A movable object? Meet unstoppable force. Zachary is getting run over. His blaster shots are getting punished, his double jumps are getting called out, he tries to stand there, Light grabs him. Light has the bigger punishes and the better reads. Light's moving too fast and mixing up too well for even Zachary's young man reactions to force him to slow down. But even before Light took the second stock, the wheels were turning in Zachary's mind. Let's take another look. Huh. I think I need to see that one more time. Run it back again? The astute observers among you may have picked out that this indeed was not the same clip three times. Within the course of a single game, Zachary figured out exactly what Light was exploiting. It's difficult to get out of shield and ultimate, and that makes Fox's aerials, particularly his Nair, oppressively difficult to punish. Light was one of the few capable of piloting Fox with the kind of precision to make it count, and one of the few who could mix up fast enough to take advantage of the fear his Nair struck into the hearts of his opponents. And his opponents, understandably, got scared. Not Zachary. Zachary latched on so severely to Light's tomahawk timing that he was able to completely disrupt Light's sense of neutral. When Fox can't land on you, he can't get his vortex going, and Zachary spent the rest of the set blowing Light up for trying to find that combo starting neutral air Fox's love so much. This is not the kind of game sense somebody so young is supposed to have. Somebody so inexperienced should have no shot against the kind of controlled rage Light throws at him, not in front of a crowd like that on a Genesis Saturday night at his very first overseas major ever. Zachary would continue to impress with his wolf on subsequent trips to America. At April's 2GG Prime Saga, his wins included Void, Mr. R, and Shutan en route to a second place finish, but he wasn't satisfied. Over the next few months, Zachary would start working some new characters into the mix. He wasn't learning anybody too crazy, you weren't about to see him rocking dial storage Shulk combos, grinding Mega Man's Metal Blade Infinite, RIP, or picking up an FGC character. 
He was learning, instead, basically all the common top tiers. A bit of Pokemon Trainer here, a sprinkle of Rob and Snake, the standard issue Pocket Wario. Pretty much every character you've ever seen referred to as fundies, whatever that means, seemed to be on Zachary's list. And after the release of Joker, he sunk a good deal of time into Smash's latest DLC top tier. It's not just that Zachary is great at picking up characters and learning them so quickly, he also has an intense understanding of what makes them great, and how he can use his fundamental understanding of the game to make those characters shine. A couple of those bars on the graph from earlier were blank. Let's fill them in as best we can. There's only one tournament each month to go on, June Sumabato SP5 and July Sumabato SP6. Reddit claims he used Pokemon Trainer as well, but in his stream matches he used a lot of Rob. He took down Zaki, the very same who beat MKLeo with King DDD in Smash 4, but was shaky going into Game 3. Pushed to a third game again by Dio, one of Japan's best snakes, Zachary switched off of Rob and went back to the Wolf. His loss to Lunamato, a top Bowser Luigi player who has continued to make waves in the post-lockdown meta, wasn't streamed. But once Zachary returned to the main stage in loser's bracket, it was all Wolf. Zachary would also use all Wolf at Sumabato SP6 the next month in a surprising 13th place finish with losses to Shoe Tone and Rain, perhaps warming up for his return to America where it would be all business. At EVO, Zachary piloted solo Wolf to top 8, placing 7th with wins over Myron, Shoe Tone, and Neotono. Zachary would follow that up with a 9th place finish the next week at Super Smash Con 2019, in part due to an unfortunate clash with MKLeo in winner's quarterfinals. For the first time in America, Zachary brought out a secondary. The Rob. And it worked. Almost. It can be hard to get a sense of how serious character selections are at Japanese tournaments where bracket cash prizes are against the law, but the fact that Zachary was willing to try Rob against MKLeo of all people should have proved just how serious he was, even if that Rob was taken to task in the early rounds of a Japanese tournament just a couple of months prior. He learns fast. So then, when upon his return to Japan at Umabura SP4, he suffered one of the worst upsets in Ultimate history in one of his first tournaments with Joker, to a wolf named Chicken. We should have known that this was just the first act though for a character with a much bigger role to play. Only a few players have ever won a major while actively using three characters. To be clear, we're sticking with the same definition here. You have to have won games with the character for them to count. That means something like Kameme's run at the Umabara major isn't on our list, because even though he used Mega Man, Wario, and Sheik, his Sheik only showed up in a single game loss against Protobanum's Lucina. Same for MKLeo at Low Tide City, where his Pyra Mithra just put up a loss against DeBuzz and he used Joker to 6-0 in Grands. Second, those game wins have to mean something as well, aka you have to to eventually win the set. That means Leo's Ike at Summit doesn't count since its one game win over Nairo didn't win the set. Speaking of Nairo, his Joker at Let's Make Big Moves is similarly disqualified because even though he beat DeBuzz with it, DeBuzz won the set. Finally, the win has to occur in Phase 2 pools or beyond, so even though we know that Tweak's DK is capable of pulling this off, its win versus Bonesaw at Glitch 6 doesn't make the cut. With those specifications in mind, three players have achieved the feat and it shouldn't be a big surprise who they are. MKLeo has done it once at Ultimate Summit with his is Wolf, Greninja, and Lucina. Zachary also has one record of the accomplishment, Kageribi number 6, where he put Sheik, Joker, and Rob to good use. Finally, Tweak has managed to win with a trio of characters twice. Let's make moves, where the aforementioned DK did get him some wins alongside Krom and Wario, who also was part of the winning roster with Wolf and Roy at Glitch. But what Tweak hasn't managed to do is win with four characters. Only two players in Ultimate History have that to their name. The first player to ever do it is actually Abadango, who used his Meta Knight, Inkling, Wario, and Sheik to win Umabara SP4 just a month and a half before Big Hass 9. And I'm pretty sure you know who the other player is. Zachary is on another level. He's the only player in history to win a major with more than two characters three times, and two of those times he actually used four characters. The most recent was at EGS Cup 3, where Zachary broke out the Mario against Abadango's Palutena in addition to his standard rotation of characters. But those characters weren't always Zachary's staples. Before EGS, before Kageribi 6, there was another tournament, one that finally made good on the potential people had seen in Zachary forever. One that might redefine our rules of what makes a character valuable in a tournament run, and the one that would finally expose the world at large to just what makes him a wild card to rule all others. It's at this point that we can mention one other peculiarity of Zachary that makes him so hard to nail down, his tournament record. This is a graph of Zachary's seed performance rating, aka how he performs in relationship to what his seed predicted. As you can see, he 
he's all over the place. One day he'll be finishing 33rd at main stage or 25th at Umabura SP4. The next day he'll sweep through a Sumabato. With Big House 9 on the horizon, this made for a very, very strange situation for some of the most underappreciated workers in the Smash community, the Cedars. Events like the Big House, where folks are coming in from all over, always create this interesting dynamic where you have to, as someone seeding the event, look at each of the players for where they're at in their careers or in their recent trends. Consistent players get rewarded for their consistency by getting seeds that closely match what they're getting in events. If they're winning constantly, they get the number one, number two, number three seeds. Inconsistent players are a gamble. Uh, whether domestically or internationally, if a player doesn't do super well sometimes and does very well other times, it's a risk to put them very high up on a seeding list just because if they fall early, then the whole balance of the ladder bracket gets thrown out of whack. So in the case of someone like Zach Ray, who coming into big house was looking at some really inconsistent placements, winning a Sumabato and getting second at an Umabura, but at the same time getting 33rd at main stage and getting 25th at a, a different Umabura, all in the last three months before Big House, make it really scary to put him high up on a seeding list. And that's why he sort of ended up there in that 13th place chunk. Zachary's Joker wasn't just struggling in Japan. Its stateside debut at main stage resulted in a disastrous 33rd place finish, a low that Zachary had only suffered once before at Frostbite. But with less than half of the entrance, main stage competition wasn't quite as steep, and it's safe to say that this was one of the worst performances of Zachary's career. Jokers may be wild, but this card wasn't quite slotting into Zachary's deck just yet. Zachary hadn't just been playing Joker, he was also using Wolf, yes, but some new characters were popping up. Ridley, Hero, Wario, Pokemon Trainer, but Zachary's big house run would be defined by two other characters. Not just any characters, in a world overrun with new characters and edgy anime boys, it would be the two oldest characters in Ultimate's massive roster that would take hold of the story at Big House 9. So this is how Zachary came to Big House. Seated 13th, switching between characters, with mixed results on his Joker. But it turns out all those ingredients were essential, and would be the key pieces in making for one of the most unique tournament runs we've ever seen in Ultimate history. One where all of his characters would put up meaningful wins, and sometimes even contribute with their losses. Zachary showed up to Big House with a different character than Joker or Wolf on his front lines. Rob. Zachary had been playing Rob in Japan for a while and even brought it out at main stage to handle Armada's inkling, and Zachary's first real obstacle at Big House was another squid kid, Cosmos. Zachary dispatched him pretty handily, only to come face to face with one of the favorites to win the tournament, Tweak. Here's the thing, because both these players had up and down performances they had somehow never played before. People had been clamoring for the matchup back when both players were in their wolf days, or when Tweak was playing Wario, but they were gonna see a different match this time. It was Rob versus Pokemon trainer, and in a back and forth match that went down to the very last stock, Zachary prevailed over the number 4 seed, making a huge upset and putting him into the path of Arfang, Pichu Master Extraordinaire, fresh off his own big upset against Light. But Zachary didn't play Rob here. No, now it's time to talk about the other retro character in this story, Game & Watch. When you've got a little rat in your way, Game & Watch is pretty good at playing Exterminator. In fact, so good that Zachary pushed Arfang off Pichu onto Palutena, and then off Palutena onto his own Rob, and that's when you really know things are getting desperate, because in the Battle of Nintendo Godfathers, the OG has the definitive advantage. And with that 3-0, Zachary was on a collision course with the other Game & Watch in bracket, Meister. But before we get to that, let's take some time to talk about Game & Watch, and about another different tournament series. In 2015, Michigan TO Ori had a realization. One week before Big House 5, as top players touched down to prepare for the tournament, his regular Smashfield weeklies was suddenly transformed into a small pond with some very big fish visiting. Visiting. Realizing that he had an opportunity on his hands, Ori made the decision that once a year he would transform the weekly into a more prestigious affair, Little Big House, an annual warm-up tournament for Big House that was still in full swing by the time 2019 came around. To give you an idea of just how stacked a weekly this was, take a look at the players in attendance. Abadongo, Zenodo, Mr. E, Cola, Shutone, and of course, Zachary. There was one other big name in attendance, Game & Watch player Meister, looking for another massive run to cement his place in Ultimate's Top 10. But for this tournament, Meister wouldn't be the only Game & Watch on the scene. No, because Zachary decided, hey, why not break out my Game & Watch for the first time ever, because he is… what? 
Wild card, baby. As you already know, it's not like Zachary just immediately starts winning when he picks up a new character, and his little big house bracket looked shaky the whole way through. As soon as winners round three, Zachary went to last game. Then, in finals of his pool, he went last game again. Top 32, game three against Ozone. But he was still winning, and kept winning by the very skin of his teeth, going to last game every single set, even while picking up wins over Mr. E and Cola on the way. On the other side of bracket, Meister managed to pull out his own clutch victories. So, now we have undoubtedly the best Game & Watch player in the world, someone known for only playing one character all the way back to Smash 4, against Zachary, master of all characters, trying out the character seriously for the first time. Watch them as they sit down, both laughing, not putting high stakes on the match. The match, of course, goes to last stock Game 5. Meister won the set and the tournament after Zachary lost another Game 5 set to Shoe Tone in Losers, but keep this set in mind, because it's only going to make what happens afterwards even weirder. So. We know that Rob versus Game & Watch is heavily in Game & Watch's favor, so we're not expecting Zachary to play that matchup. But he's just shown his proficiency in the ditto, so seems pretty obvious what he should do, right? He has not yet selected his character. He's got the whole board at his disposal. Corin? Huh? What is, what is Zachary? Now, Zachary was a Corrin main in Smash 4, but let's take a look at the graph of character play rate again. See that little orange bit? That's Corrin. And if you peek back before this, yeah, there's absolutely no Corrin. So why does Zachary choose Corrin when he's already shown he can't put up a fight with another character? What's going on behind those glasses behind his eyes? What does he know that we don't? Corrin? Is this really the solution to Meister? Why does Zachary switch? Beats us? Because Corrin clearly isn't the answer. Zachary switches to Joker, but that's not the solution either. And with a swift 3-0 from Meister, Zachary's in the loser's bracket. He's already played four characters, but one of them didn't get any wins, and he has a familiar face waiting for him. Once again, Zachary and Tweak go to game five, and once again, Zachary's Rob proves too much for Tweak to handle, even with the young Link in the mix. Next up, another multi-character specialist, Nairo. Well, sort of. Let's look at Nairo's graph. As you can see, Nairo is no stranger to breaking out an odd counter pick. You certainly know his Zero Suit Samus, and chances are you know about his Ganondorf as well, but at the end of the day, the dude started out as a Lucina main and then became a Palutena main. He may have other characters, but they're rare occurrences, that special flavor at the ice cream shop that's only in rotation once a month. True to form, Nairo went all Palutena against Zachary, who opted for Wolf most of the match. But after getting JV3 stocked in Game 4, Zachary takes a long, hard think, then locks in his Joker. This set confirms some something really important. Zachary tailors his counterpicks to the game, not just the character. We knew this from the set with Meister, but let's be honest, Corrin was getting worked. This set against Nairo is completely different. Sure, Zachary may have just lost in pretty brutal fashion, but his Wolf won the two games before that. It's obviously capable of beating Nairo's Palutena. But let's take a moment to identify exactly why Nairo's Palu ran away with that game four. Simply put, he put Zachary on a one-way ticket on an airplane and never let him make a return flight. Palu's ability to build up immense early damage put Zachary in a hole nearly impossible to get out of. Wolf's honest hitboxes left him reaching for kills, taking more damage, and getting absolutely worked. Joker isn't just a momentum change. It's a perfect solution to these problems. With Arsene, Joker has access to kill moves with a best-in-class combination of speed and range. And how do you get Arsene? That's right, by taking damage. Zachary's counterpick here actually turns Nairo's strengths against him. He repeatedly goes down in percent due to Palutena combos, then leverages Arsene to make a comeback. One an especially clean example example, just look at the ending of the set. It's even percent last stock, Zachary takes an extended string for a whopping 58.6%, and in the process, gets Arsene. Immediately, things are all Zachary. He puts together a combo of his own to virtually tie things up, and then after a little bit more back and forth, is able to use the tail end of that very same Arsene to beat Nairo. Zachary didn't need to counterpick here, but it's here that we see that even with all the character changes, all the growth, this is the same Zachary who people apart with Wolf at Genesis. He's still watching for your weaknesses, ready to play the perfect card, and with his counterpicks, he stacked the deck in his favor. With that emphatic win, Zachary has proven the metal of his counterpicks in a mid-set situation, and set himself up for a rematch with the man who has beaten him twice this week already, Meister. We know Corrin doesn't work. Joker didn't get a win either. Is it time for Rob matchup be damned, or maybe Wolf? Or will Zachary ditto Meister again since he did so well before? How do you solve a problem like Meister? So, oh! The Sonic now, he's just picking whatever, way. he's just throwing anything at All right, the Zachary. wall now. I mean, Zachary, I've, I've had him. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, Zachary's graph. Wild card. 
So for a second time, Zachary picks a character that he's never played before against Meister, desperate to find a new solution to the impenetrable beeps and boops of Game & Watch. And once again, he goes down 0-2. To be honest, his Sonic doesn't look bad, but this is still certainly not a place he wants to be. At this point, you're probably starting to doubt Zachary's counterpicks. Both his surprises, Corrin and Sonic, have done nothing except hand Meister two free games. Sure, he plays a lot of characters, but what's the point if you're just losing with them? But that's not how Zachary sees the game. The Sonic was and pointless. It was a critical part of his plan. Take it from the man himself. What we know about Zachary is that he takes his time to figure out your timings, then picks the perfect time to strike. But one of those things about Game & Watch that most often frustrates players is how hard it is to punish him for throwing out big moves. And in their first set, Zachary was constantly just missing timings or spacings to punish Meister, especially when it came down to perhaps the most infuriating combo of options Game & Watch has, up -y out of shield and down air. We want to make it clear here that we're not downplaying Meister's skill at all, as he said himself that he understands this part of Game & Watch can be absurd to deal with. Meister unabashedly abuses up B against players foolish enough to touch Game & Watch's shield. His raw smash attacks in neutral are part of this plan, as he lures you in, then plays a mix-up with either another hitbox or shield into up B, which also might counter-hit you. If he whiffs or is otherwise in the air, he'll then use Game & Watch's down air and good horizontal drift to get out of disadvantage. Take a look at this graph of Meister's up Bs in his first set. He's using the move whenever possible, and a lot of the time, he's getting significant reward from it. Now look at the down airs. This graph shows how often Zachary was able to punish a down air on stage, or whether he traded, failed to punish, or even worse, got counter hit. As you can see, he punished it a few times, but more often than not, Meister was able to get out of a bad situation, and with the advantage in matchup knowledge, he just ran over Zachary in their first set, setting the pace the entire time. But if there's any character to stall things out, it's Sonic. Now, if we look at the stats on up B's and down airs during the Sonic games, you'll see they actually look fairly similar. The one thing that changes is that Meister hits Zachary with the key a lot less, which makes sense. Zachary is very rarely underneath Meister as Sonic, using his grounded mobility to be in a different place entirely. If we look at the footage itself, we can see some pretty telling things. Zachary spent a significant amount of his time on the Hedgehog running away, feeling Meister out, setting the pace himself, and one of the primary ways he did that was by threatening Spin Dash. Whenever Zachary Spin Dashes, Meister, very reasonably, chooses one of two options. First, he shields. Smart, since Zachary can't threaten grab, and it plays into his overall game plan of using up at of shield. Once Meister has a lead, he starts threatening with smash attacks, a plan that actually gets him a fair few victories. Zachary's Sonic wasn't good enough to win, but it was good enough to expose Meister's patterns, giving Zachary the data he needs to actually pull off a victory with a character he actually plays. Game 3 is still very close, but there's one big, big change, one that we need to look at another stat to understand. This is a graph of all Zachary's grab attempts in each game. The ones that come in neutral, the ones that come in advantage state, and the ones that he whiffs. For clarity, we're not counting grabs that come as a guaranteed follow-up at a combo. What should be immediately apparent is that after the Joker switch, Zachary is attempting, and finding, way more grabs than before. Now, some of this comes down to character. Joker obviously wants to grab more than Sonic, who likes to threaten fast approaching hitboxes, or Corrin, who uses her disjoints. But even when we compare Zachary's one game as Joker in set one, there's a huge difference. Not only is Zachary grabbing more often, he's finding more grabs in neutral as opposed to ledge trap or advantage situations, and he's almost doubled his damage off of them. What's the reason for this change? Simple, it beats shield. I know, I know, this is Smash 101, but it's hard to deny. Look at Zachary's run-up grab attempts in Game 3. Think of it this way. Meister is sitting pretty, stable, on a stool. It has three legs, shield, up B, and down air. But once one leg of that stool comes off, the whole thing loses its balance. Zachary had been pretty back and forth on punishing Game & Watch Dare throughout the set, but it's been a fairly consistent overall rate, around 25% of the time. This holds true for this Joker game. Meister only dares four times, likely because of Smashville's middle platform, and Zachary only punishes once, but oh boy, is it a punish that matters. Arson, can it be the difference? Oh my, that interception with the up B, that was godlike. Oh, 94%, he's gotta find a way to, oh, damage, the up air. The, oh, oh my, my god! god! Adios, amigo! <laughs> 
In game 4, there are two big changes. First, Meister stops up being out of shield almost entirely. There's an obvious reason for this. The grabs are still here. When Zachary grabs, he either yoinks Meister out of shield or he whiffs, in which case Meister is going to pick a better option like a Nair or grab of his own. At this point, two legs of the stool have been knocked off completely, and down air is all that's left. The other big change in this game 4 has to do with Meister's down airs. He starts using the move again with his tally reaching all the way up to 10, but now Zachary is punishing better than ever before, reaching a 40% punish rate for the first time in their two sets. And once again, he's making those punishes matter in a big way. By this point, Meister doesn't have a leg to sit or stand on, and game 5 is a procedural dismantling that exemplifies all of the points we've tracked. Meister has lost faith in up B, only using the move once. Even when he has a chance to use it, he goes for something else. Why? Because he's scared of getting down, and rightfully so. Meister only down airs four times, and Zachary punishes him 75% of the time. And finally, the grabs? Well, we'll just let the ending of the set speak for itself. One's coming back to the stage here, but unfortunately he came back with his big brother Arson, and we're finishing it! Zachary is into the summit! Sonic didn't get Zachary any wins, but it let Zachary build the game plan he needed to beat Meister. Now, do we actually think Zachary had a master plan of losing two games with Sonic to download Meister and formulate the perfect plan to eliminate him? No. The kid's not a computer, but Sonic was the first step to figure out Meister's own plan and build a counterpunch entirely designed to beat it. Step 1, make Meister shield. Step 2, win Big House 9. In his final two sets, Zachary wouldn't exhibit any more of the switching within sets, but he still effortlessly pivoted between characters, going Wolf for DeBuzz's Olimar, then seamlessly switching to Rob to neutralize the Rosalina. Here's something sort of wild. After losing to Meister, Zachary never spent more than five games in a row on one character. He played five games of Rob, then two games of Wolf, then a game of Joker, then two of Sonic, three more of Joker, three more of Wolf, and then four of Rob to win the tournament. What's so mind-blowing about Zachary isn't just that he has so many counterpicks, it's that he's so willing to switch between them at a moment's notice. Maybe it's not that he's a wild card, endlessly shifting, it's just that he stacks the deck in his favor. Zachary's got all the cards in his hand, and you better hope he doesn't pick the right one for you. For those of you keeping track, that makes four characters that Zachary won games with at Big House, the most characters ever used by a major winner. But it's here that we might need to change our framework. From what Zachary said, Sonic was a vital part of his game plan. So is it really fair to include characters that didn't take games even if the set was won? If we were to hypothetically credit Sonic for Zachary's win, that makes five characters used to win a major. If we retroactively apply the same criteria to our old list, it changes things a bit, sure. Kamehameha gets a three character win at Umabura Major, Tweak gets upgraded to three discrete trio victories because of his DK at Frostbite 2019, and oh yeah, Zachary's Kagaribi victory becomes a four character run. But even with this new criteria, Zachary becomes the only player in history to ever win a major with five different characters. Speaking of, let's go back to that list of characters people have won majors with. Once we tack the Sonic on there, Zachary's number balloons to a staggering nine characters. And hey, could we consider the Corrin? Probably not. Fact is, we don't need to. Zachary is indisputably the most versatile character player of all time, Corrin or not. You know that Bruce Lee quote that some tutor at your local probably likes to repeat? I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. Zachary is somehow the epitome of that quote and the antithesis. It is indisputable that Zachary's fundamentals are among the best in the game. Remember Ultimate Summit's 3 Wi-Fi Warrior event, aka the lag bracket? Zachary stunted on everyone with the power of game sense, and Dark Samus, but that's beside the point. Seriously, Wi-Fi Warrior aside, Zachary's unflinching presence has been the definitive aspect of his play since his first appearance in the scene. Of course, it's that very dedication to the fundamentals that allows him to play so many characters at such a high level. He's at once one of the most solid players in Ultimate and one of the hardest to pin down. There's one other thing about Zachary that makes him such an unknown quantity. When we first saw Zachary, he was the unmovable rock, prone to suddenly freezing in place and holding position. You'd never see that today, but it's not because he's any less dedicated to positional advantage. Look at his matches with Shutan from Kagaribi. You see a Joker that is mobile, agile, but also invested in using the character's unique zoning tools to hold space. Spargo and Cola may be the young blood in the scene today, but before them, Zachary was the new kid on the block. Let's not forget that before Ultimate, he was the youngest player to ever be ranked on a Smash 4 PGR. As we can see from just watching his play, that time has given him time to expand his playstyle. Zachary's characters aren't the only new thing that he's going to bring to the table. He'll continue to mature and develop. This is true of all good players, of course, but Zachary can also express his different skills in so many 
many different ways with his character Ocean. Check out his YouTube, it's just him practicing Greninja, Joker, Game & Watch, Sheik, Rob, keeping all of his characters warm. Screw practicing one kick 10,000 times. He'll practice 10 kicks 20,000 times. So